The second point about um, urbanism, um, these two images, three images, I guess, is the contribution of Carl Andre in, in a book um, called The New Avant-Garde in the early 70s. And it, it gives you a sensibility of the vocabulary of horizontality and minimalist um, uh, material choice, you know, the industrial materials, that actually is coming directly out of the street landscape. Um, that's sort of the point that I wanted to make with those um, images. And the work that we included in our show is a um, kind of a book sequence of photographs that Carl Andre made, not unlike this, but of his hometown in Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, he's one of the artists who's part of the gang, you know, with Smithson and Heiser in the early years, but he refuses to be identified as earth artist um, pretty quickly. And when we were doing the research and interview, he said, I like, I don't like to watch other people make my work. That was his um, explanation for why he distanced himself from um, these other artists who needed bulldozers and workers to you know, dig those gigantic holes, um, for instance. Um, he also said the landscape scared him. Um, it petrified him because his eyes can't lean on anything which was a really interesting expression. You know, that when you see an endless horizon, that it's a source of fright for, um, uh, panic for um, Carl Andre, um, which also was very interesting. Also to think about minimalism, again, with those kinds of ideas in mind. Um, the urban context for land art, earth art, um, some of it is articulated more in the catalog than in the exhibition itself. This is Drag Mass by um, Michael Heiser in front of the Detroit Art Institute. Um, Sam Wagstaff, who's a really important curator also for the development of this category, giving opportunities to young artists, was the um, curator who made this happen. And um, Heiser's expectation was that by dragging this huge piece of stone, across the front yard of the Detroit Art Institute, it would create this you know, huge kind of sculpture out of the dirt, right? That it would kind of dig into the earth and gouge it. So there it is, the operation as a kind of an urban spectacle, which didn't quite work out. <laughs> um, in fact, there was uproar among the Detroit citizens um, and uproar in the museum board. Um, that they paid all this money to just basically have their lawn totally ruined. <laughs> um, of course, from Michael's perspective, they totally didn't get it. But um, um, one of the board members insisted that it be removed and that he would be happy to dynamite it himself, um, which is what happened. Sam Wagstaff protests, of course, and then um, you know he's asked to pay for the cost of the removal, which he has to pay for, and then he quits the institution. Um, but in any case, this is one of those um, failures that is actually um, not very well known, that is very interesting to return to in relation to land arts um, interventions in the urban context, the difficulty itself. Now, most of you know, recently, a levitated mass arrived in Los Angeles. Did you guys follow that? Michael Govan, who's the director of LA, uh, LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum, formerly of DIA Foundation, um, big supporter of these heroic land artists, um, a project that I don't know how many uh, dollars were involved, a gigantic rock made a tr uh, trip from um, its quarry to uh, Los Angeles through so all sorts of fanfare and media coverage with people lining the streets saying, the rock is coming, rock is coming. <laughs> and it arrived and now is permanently installed at, um, on the grounds of LACMA in the front lawn, very much poised as a you know, work of sublime aesthetic accomplishment. The antithesis of this in some ways. Um, but land art has a life in the city is actually basically the point I guess I wanted to make. Um, uh, 
An artist totally lost to history of land art is Patricia Johansson, and this is one of like my moment of happiness for the show when we were able to give her a lot of real estate in the exhibition. Um, she, her background is as a kind of a minimalist painter who leaves New York for various reasons and develops kind of her own practice. And this is um, a 16 foot long painting that is laid on a derelict railway line between Vermont and New York. Um, and her experiment was really about how far the eye can see before the colors merge to an indistinct um, state. And 1,600 feet, she um, experimented, was kind of the limit of uh, perception. Um, this is 1968 in October. Um, and this date I'd like you to remember. Um, so here she is, pre-feminist movement in a way, um, doing her, her project. This was also temporary because even though the railway line was no longer running on this um, uh, space, once the railroad company knew what she had done, they said, please take it away. Um, but there was a lot of media coverage. Again, media was central here. Uh, she became kind of a poster girl for this kind of new uh, weird art um, from the mainstream's perspective. She was covered in Vogue magazine. And you, you could imagine the sexual politics of featuring a woman artist versus dealing with male artists. The, the guys were the cowboys and, you know, tough macho characters. And then the girl is doing her color thing. Um, <laughs> But anyway, we had the uh, film that she had made of this piece um, uh, installed in the gallery. But um, this is a work that clearly deals with um, urbanism, transportation networks. Um, uh, she will go on to become, get a degree in engineering. She's very active today as um, kind of an artist consultant engineer working with various cities and dealing with um, uh, urban design, um, park design. Um, infrastructure design, um, water management. Um, it was interesting to note that several women artists like Merle Laterman Eucalys, Mary Miss, um, they will all kind of move towards urban city planning and take their work to kind of uh, dealing with the city as a system. Um, I'll show you some other, uh, a whole other set of works that uh, we showed of her work. Now, here's an anecdote also um, about length of uh, sculpture. Um, uh, the mayor of New York saw the coverage on television of this piece. Um, you know, there were lots of aerials and, and such, and he thought it would be great to install it permanently in Central Park of New York, which, you know, if you're an artist, that sounds fantastic. Um, but she needed 1,600 feet run, and she said she couldn't find one place in, New, uh, in Central Park that had that space, that open run. And um, 1,500 was the max. That's the magic number for land art. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the mayor just said, why don't you just cut it, you know, to size? And she, of course, refused because the piece is about how far you could see um, uh, with your bare eye. So then it got dismantled and and when we met with her to ask about the piece, because we thought we could install it in Los Angeles, because there's a lot of like long, straight spaces in Los Angeles. And she said, oh, it's now the roof of my barn, because um, she had cut it up and uh, used it to um, renovate her studio, because uh, she couldn't afford to buy new plywood. So um, that's the fate of that work. Um, and then um, more urban system infrastructure design as part of land art is this, this Smithson, which is the Dallas-Fort Worth um, airport project um, when he's engaged as an artist consultant for a major airport design firm. Um, this is actually the beginning of him thinking in very different ways than his kind of um, crystalline minimalist sculptures in which he's really thinking master plan and systems. Um, and then here's more Patricia Johansson. Um, they're very weird park design plans. Some are goofy, like, you know, parks in the shape of butterflies. But there's always a kind of a system that's um, 
being conceptualized. And this is early, mid-60s, you know, um, where buildings that could uh, recycle its own water, for instance, or um, connecting the blood of the abattoir, the slaughterhouses into the, you know, shopping areas, grocery stores, things like that. Um, so he, we had a suite of her drawings. These are her um, house and garden drawings. She was, again, asked because of her popularity from the Stephen Long, the long piece, um, House and Garden magazine, I don't know if you know, they're for like housewives with good taste to decorate there. Anyway, the editor asked her if she would come up with some garden designs for the readers. So she came up with, with these, you know, ecologically oriented, totally perverse um, um, infrastructural redesign as propositions for House and Garden, which were of course all rejected, never published. And, um, but we got to showcase um, 50 of them um, for our show. And then of course, um, architects like Super Studio were included as well as really engaging with land and space and new technologies, but really from the point of view of urban context. Um, now, before I get to the issue of media, um, I do wanna talk about the art system and the point that it doesn't really land art really couldn't have happened outside the art system. And um, the first exhibition, historically speaking, I mean, there are other kind of ephemeral art exhibitions happening in Europe a little bit before, but this is the first show that really puts this term on the table, earthworks. Um, it's actually a term that I think actually Robert Morris coins, and um, I think it gets associated with Smithson. This is why a lot of these artists hate Smithson just so you know. <laughs> um, um, this is the installation view and um, the invitation card of that exhibition, Earthworks, which was at the Virginia Dwan Gallery in New York City, 57th Street, one of those, not even Soho, it's one of those older um, spaces. And Virginia Dwan, there's no land art without Virginia Dwan. Um, so it was important for us to feature her. Um, the Exhibition is originally conceived as an outdoor enterprise. Um, Smithson and Dwan are very close at this point and um, um, they look for sites in New Jersey. They don't find anything, so then they come back into the gallery. Um, and the dilemma of how to show this kind of art is from the get-go uh, with this kind of an exhibition. But it's very clear that it starts in the gallery with carpeted floors. Um, you see Robert Smith in one of the non-sites. On the wall are uh, Carl Andre photographs of experiments that he's doing out in nature where he's petrified because he can't, his eyes can't <laughs> find anything to rest on. In the foreground is a Robert, Smith, uh, Robert Morris untitled work. Sometimes it's called untitled dirt, untitled earthwork, untitled. Um, a lot of artists switch around their titles, also that makes it confusing for researchers. Um, behind it is a painting by Walter de Maria. It's a yellow monochrome with a plaque in the center that's made of metal that says, color of the earth when men attack it. And it's, I think, alluding to the bulldozer colors, you know, the caterpillar bulldozers. Um, and then on the, on the far end, on the far right side of the installation shot is a work by Klaus Oldenburg. Again, he's part of the mix. It's basically a cube filled with dirt and earthworms. Um, now, for us, it was very clear that this category is made through these exhibitions. It's not artists making a work that makes a category that makes a kind of a movement. But those who come to uh, delimit it, define it, um, give it kind of a public forum or uh, platform. And um, so this, if this is the origin of earth art, and many people say this is the exhibition, then we, we can say it starts in the gallery. Um, it's also um, very eclectic in media. So we have sculpture, we have painting, we have photography. Oldenburg also showed a film. Um, there's a light box uh, per, uh, images by Heitzer. Here's another view. 
And so, you know, this work I think most people see as anti-form, formless, post-minimal. Um, and then on the far side you see Soloit. And so, actually what I wanted to do was recreate this exhibition in our exhibition. Um, as a curatorial and art historical, um, I don't know, gambit, experiment. Um, that it's like a period room. Um, and that if you saw the entire exhibition, you would see that the myth of land art as this kind of heroic, gigantic works out in the desert would be so easily undermined. Um, people at the museum didn't like that idea very much. And um, they also thought if we highlight one show, it's too um, focused, that actually it's a much more dispersed um, condition of production. Um, so I just want you to register Earthworks, October of 68. This is the same time that Patricia Johansson's made that piece in the, um, on the rail lines, but that's completely like not part of this conversation. That's, the, that's part of the problem that we wanted to highlight for, uh, through our show. Um, the second show, so three exhibitions, late 68, early 69, within a four month period is when this category just kind of comes into focus. Um, so Earthworks at Duan Gallery, October of 68, Earth Art Exhibition in Ithaca, New York on the campus of Cornell University at Andrew Dixon White Museum, it's curated by Willoughby Sharp, um, and that's the group. Um, the director of the museum is standing at the left, and then you see Neil Jenny, Dennis Oppenheim, uh, Gunter Ucker, Jan Dibitz, Richard Long, Robert Smithson. There's Heiser and DeMaria also in the show, but they'll pull out of the exhibition. Um, this is the museum, quite Victorian, not so avant-garde at all, but um, um, a few words about Willoughby Sharp. So Virginia Duan comes from money. She's the heiress of 3M, you know, the tape, um, from Minnesota. Um, she ha ran a gallery in Los Angeles, brought a lot of um, European artists into the United States, like um, Yves Klein, Jean Tangley. There's an important LA history to that reception that is not known. Um, then she opens a gallery in New York you know, hangs with these, these artists, trying to show kind of new art and making a kind of name for herself as a dealer. Um, this was, uh, this is an anecdote that made me actually very sad. Carl Andre said this was also why he didn't want to hang out with earth artists is because they were all trying to get money out of Virginia. Like who could get more money out of Virginia? Um, and I just thought that's so sad. Um, but anyway, Virginia Duan is also responsible for bringing a lot of European curators to actually go and see a lot of these Americans. She's a kind of conduit. And she's, you know, Upper East Side New York, let's say. Willard B. Sharp, on the other hand, is kind of hippie, um, crass. He doesn't have much money. Um, he's not part of the same social circle. Um, he's a total devotee of Eve Klein. Um, and the earth art show is part of a four-part show he imagines, air art, earth art, you sort of see Eve Klein's, um, uh, fire, uh, water. He realizes air art in, uh, at Berkeley, um, and then he gets a call from um, the director of the White Museum, says, can I do the air art show? And um, air art's already taken, so he proposes um, the earth art show. <laughs> so, in a way, um, he's an independent curator, like he's not tied to an institution and such. And I think this is actually a really paradigm-making exhibition in which um, most of you are probably familiar. Artists are um, brought to the site and they make the work on site. They don't bring works that are made elsewhere. So that's already the kind of the precedent of site-based practice that we know today. Um, Secondly, all the artists are asked to work outside and inside the gallery. So um, uh, this is Richard Long kind of exploring the, the landscape and quarries in Ithaca, New York. Um, and then, you know, the rocks he'll bring back to um, the museum and he'll do some kind of a layout in front. But he's also 
installing a photo piece in the inside of the gallery that has to do with this traversal of going to get the rocks and you know having to occupy the gallery space itself. Um, I don't know if I could convey well enough the sense of the artist trying to figure it out. Like that's what I sense from doing the research. It's not that you know idea of sight non sight you know, just kind of pops into Smithson's head. There's a lot of clunky struggling with what is it that you do, you know, there, and then you have to show something in here. How do you uh, conceptualize that? How do you materially articulate that? Um, I think all the artists are struggling with that in various ways, and Smithson ha happened to formally articulate it with this idea of sight, non-sight. Um, or Oppenheim, you know, he's cutting through the iced over pond there, um, BB Lake. Apparently it never gets cold enough anymore that you could do this. Um, the climate has changed. And this famously is the exhibition in which Gordon Meta Clark, as a student, is running around helping the artists and, um, you know, gets inspired to pursue art instead of architecture. Um, but he too will be working what to do. Um, and this is the beginning of his gallery transplant series when the outline of the interior gallery space in plan gets transposed outside. This is his second outdoor work. Um, trying to create some visual system of uh, spatial relationality in some way. Um, and I say this is a paradigm making exhibition. One, because of what the artists are, um, the task of the artist and how it's become kind of the way that a lot of project-based artists work. Like you don't make art until you get to the site, you respond to the context and um, you then immediately have to contend with issues of its relay into another context. Um, Willoughby Sharp is at the very beginning engaged with uh, media production around the entire activity of planning the exhibition, documenting the artists working on a daily basis. It's almost like a film set from what I can gather where they have a kind of a meeting in the morning. Everyone knows what everyone's doing and then the film people just kind of follow and track. Um, the filmmaker was a young film student and as a woman she couldn't follow all the artists to every location like Smithson was going down to the salt mines and women weren't, weren't allowed so she couldn't go in. But um, otherwise there's incredibly long footage, film footage, raw film footage, um, I think over 16 hours worth, that is now in the archive of Will Willoughby Sharp, unedited. Um, you know, he died and now it's in the hands of his uh, widow and um, uh, whoever can get their hands on this archive and pull it all together. It'll be amazing resource for understanding better this period because Sharp was also a connection to Europe in a way that a lot of other um, curators at this time were not. Um, um, anyway, Hans Hacke, inside outside work. He did a lot of work in the frozen um, lakes and then he also did this famous grass grows piece um, which you know sprouted during the run of the show and then it died um, before the end of the show. And you see the interior of the uh, um, exhibition space. This was heavily covered by Life magazine also. Um, my god, have I talked for an hour? Um, let me just show you, okay, Heiser, friendly days with Smithson, doing a trench in the backyard of the gallery. Robert Morris, he phones this in. Um, he doesn't fly to Ithaca. He said, you know, it's snowing, it's too hard. So, <laughs> phoned in art. There's a paradigm make, making um, situation. This is a Walter de Maria piece, which um, I think echoes that yellow painting, um, conceptually, content-wise. Um, but at the opening, he, uh, what's the right word? Retracts the work just like Michael Heiser retracts the work and he doesn't want to be in the show. So they just kind of like mess up the um, pile and they're officially not in the catalog, but they actually did works. So I want to, you know, I'm trying to like correct that history as well. Um, 
I feel like I'm like uh, at a loss because I'm already at an hour. That's a long time to no keep going. Okay, um, and then this is Les Levine um, who was hired by the museum director to come up with um, come up for the opening from New York to basically take photographs of the opening. This is a very like media oriented event. Um, so we'll, you know, Ithaca is about five hour drive from New York City. It's actually remote in, in terms of, um, you know, trains will bypass it, for instance. Um, so they flew in a group of critics for the opening. It's the beginning of the biennial culture. It's just small, that's all. Um, that's why I say it's a uh, paradigm maker too. So they, all the press comes. Um, and it's an event. Um, Les Levine documents it, and then he makes a piece out of the documentation, which is um, um, a series of photographs. You see kind of the details individually, but then he'll make a basically a big mess, a pile that's covered in jello. Um, and his sense was that as soon as you have ephemeral art, dematerialized art, it's media. Um, there is no such thing as no material. The material transfers into media material. And um, he was already kind of, you know, savvy about that and that it's basically, as he put it, kind of this like glop of um, information. Um, we will, we remade this piece for the exhibition. And then the third exhibition, so Earthworks at Duan Gallery, Earth Art and Ithaca, and then just a couple months later, it is um, Gary Shum's Land Art Television Exhibition, made for Berlin Television, and quite, you know, um, radical in conceptualizing the exhibition site, like where do you have an exhibition? It's not a gallery space with objects in it, but it's actually television for broadcast. Um, and he had eight works. Um, there was an opening um, in which making of the work as photographs were displayed and then the monitors were showing the, um, the program or the exhibition itself. And um, so the opening was actually earlier. And Gary Shum's the guy on the right looking very Steve McQueen, like <laughs> cool. Um, and actually, Philip and I were not sure how um, and in what context Gary Shum might have known the American artists that are in his program. Um, but through docu you know, looking through archives, he was at the opening of Earth Art, for instance. He flew from Germany to be there. And then he took Dennis Oppenheim and Smithson to make works in Ithaca for this show. Um, so this is uh, Richard Long is in it. Gary Shum also dies in 73 um, of suicide, so we also didn't want to make 73 that a marker for our show, given that fact. De Maria. So these are sequences of films. Um, Shum would invent certain like kind of tripod technology in order to film these works too, and he would see film as integral to imagining um, land art. Like they have to kind of go together. Um, Jan Dibitz's work, work that is made specifically for the kind of the viewing position of um, through the camera. And then these would be the kind of photos that would be on the walls. Um, so there's a way that, you know, media, as when I say media practice as much as a sculptural one, there's a sense of other media being material. So for instance, Robert Berry, you know, conceptual art, photography, text, etc. But I also mean it in terms of media, um, you know, in terms of broadcast, um, television, things like this. Is John Baldessari's work, which um, was Philip always said, because I think this work is kind of, eh, but um, Philip said Europeans don't know it. We have to put it in the show. Um, it's um, the map of California, in which. Baldessari goes to the locations where each letter falls, and then he places the letter on that location and then photographs you know, his having been there. So it spells out California, literally in the landscape. Um, and then, um, actually, this is the image that ultimately I 
that we fought for for the show's cover. Um, it's a military map of Mormon Mesa in Nevada, pointing the fingers Walter De Maria's pointing at the site of Mormon Mesa, the double negative site. This is um, from a contact sheet by Gianfranco Gorgoni, the photographer without whom we also don't have land art. He's like every picture that you've probably seen of all the major works are by Gorgoni. There's a struggle over who has the rights to those images, whether it belongs to the artist or the photographer. That also I think is um, a persistent, pervasive issue around authorship of images um, around this practice. In any case, we found this in a contact sheet and there's dirt under Walter de Maria's fingers too. So there's, you know, earth art show with dirt, that's good. <laughs> um, uh, and we even had the design all laid out and everything. Um, but de Maria and uh, Michael Heiser are not in the exhibition. They refuse to be in the exhibition. Um, and their absence, in some ways, for some people, makes this show, you know, like, not so uh, legitimate. You know, like, how can you have a show on land art and not have these two artists included? On the other hand, I think their position of why they don't want to be in the show was important to include. Um, in a way, it's a picture of the current state of the field, um, and it functions around issue of media. Um, someone like Heiner Friedrich, the DIA group, De Maria, Heiser, I don't know about Smithson, how he would have fallen on this issue, but those people feel there's no work that you could show in a gallery and call it land art or earth art or anything. That work is just out there. It's not representable. It's um, and all the work that I've just kind of shown you, it's totally illegitimate work in the um, eyes of these artists. Um, all you need to see earth art is, as Heiner Friedrich told us, just a bus to the desert. Um, but this idea of this remoteness elsewhere, isolation, land, land art is isolation, that's what DeMaria said. We actively tried to counter. We wanted to historicize it. We wanted to contextualize it. We wanted to see other practices that were all around it. And the importance of media really as an integral part of being even art, able to articulate this elsewhere. Um, in fact, uh, Michael Heiser and Walter De Maria both made extremely interesting media works around their land art projects, film and ph photographic, um, which they kind of deny as really legitimate, important work. Uh, so there's still more work to do on rewriting the history of land art once maybe they pass away. Um, I mean, it's kind of uh, funny, but it's also not funny in the sense of um, the power that some of these artists have over what kind of knowledge and information and discourse is made public. Um, we struggled a lot with, um, uh, with that. Um, the yellow painting, for instance, we you know, borrowed from the De Menil collection in Houston, then De Maria uh, you know, intervened and said, uh, to the De Menil, um Museum, don't loan that work to that show. Um, so it just prevented us from um, kind of having the kind of show that we ultimately might have wanted, but maybe that's also a good thing, these kind of challenges and being able to um, take a position in relation to it. Anyway, the fact that this is Walter De Maria's finger and it's pointing toward the side of double negative, even though I don't think Walter would know that that's his finger, the lawyers at LA MOCA um, said, you cannot use this image, he may sue us. This, I don't know if that's a, a common issue in Iceland. <laughs> um, but this idea of litigation, maybe because it's in LA, it's Hollywood or something, that everyone's fearful of being sued, so um, it controls the um, narrative. Now, I'm way over, I'm just gonna run through some installation shots. This is in Los Angeles. So there's four different entries into the show. The first, um, we don't give an or origin date for the show. We always say 274, but we don't say where we start. One of the earlier works is Charles and Ray Eames' Powers of Ten. 
the very first rendition of you know pulling in and out of um, the earth. Um, Group E, a second project by them there, and um, Anselmo's um, piece here that was, um, it's a compass at the very tip pointing north. Um, or you might enter at this point with conceptual art with Lawrence Wiener. Um, but this, Philip and I, um, we found this, we wanted to locate the viewer here as a beginning point with Blowing Up Over the World by Jean Tangli, kind of the parody of that and Noguchi's um, uh, uh, Monument to Man, which is um, a work actually from the 30s, um, in which you really kind of imagine looking at the earth from way, way far away, and also it's kind of following on the heels of world, um, a different world um, in war. Um, Eve Klein becomes a kind of a key central figure for us, um, and situating Eve Klein as really needing to be part of this discourse. One of his earliest kind of conceptualization of dealing with the earth is to cover it with concrete, um, the whole earth, um, covering it with concrete as a gesture of protecting its fragility. It's kind of weird, but um, anyway, I won't, I won't dwell on these. So we had fluxes. What would be recognized under different categories, fluxes? Um, we moved from Noguchi into the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport project. Noguchi actually was commissioned um, in the 30s and 40s to be the artist working with the development of Newark Airport, which was then the largest airport in the world um, internationally. Um, and Smithson functions almost like a curator inviting other artists to do projects for areas around the runway. And um, he also importantly, um, when he writes about this experience towards the air terminal, um, the essay that he writes, he also talks about the live feed between works that are situated on the runway and what people experience like passengers when they're in the terminal. So he's um, imagining already kind of a live satellite um, scenario of simultaneous experience of there and here. Um, so we couldn't get the yellow painting um, so I had the thought, like, let's just paint the whole wall yellow. So in Munich, Robert, Robert Moore saw this photograph and said, I don't like that yellow behind my work. <laughs> so in Munich, Munich, we didn't do it. But this is a work, again, that's redone. Um, I just want to kind of throw out the redo issue um, uh, in which his assistant of 15 years came out to do the piece. Um, it's the first time that it's been photographed in color, so now people know that it's not just a pile of one color dirt, you know, that it's not a monochromatic piece. Uh, that's all like motor oil. It's, it was very toxic, the, the smell of it. But this sort of area is a quasi-recreation of the exhibition Earthworks, the Duan Gallery show. So the film in the back is Klaus Oldenburg, the film of him doing the whole, the grave digging project. And then, you know, this blueprints, um, photographs by Carl Andre. And we were very interested in kind of overlaps and sightline um, connections. So, you know, a work uh, by Boetti that would be associated with Arte Povera and linking it with Robert Smithson's very first non site. Um, uh, this is also redone for our show. This is Neil Jenny's last sculpture ever that he did an earth art exhibition in Ithaca um, that collapsed three times during um, its run in Ithaca. Uh, also during the research, we found a film by Willoughby Sharp himself. He, he was kind of a curator, but he was also a filmmaker and a performance person himself. So we decided to screen it. It's the first time it was shown. It's, it's his fire piece. It's his homage to Eve Klein, I think. Um, that's on the screen um, there. So as I look at these photographs, I'm remembering a lecture I gave before we were even close to installing the show um, in which I said, I really just don't want white galleries with black and white photographs on there. Um, so in some places we don't have that, but this is Gunter Ucker's piece recreated for the show. It's actually um, the original version. In Ithaca, there were um, two, you see a knife 
in the middle of the sand pile, which actually rotates very slowly. In the Ithaca version, there were two. Um, but he said this was the original, so we did that. Um, the Les Levine. He came and recreated this piece. It may be the last time the artist will be involved in making the work. And interestingly, when we did this in Munich, the jello, so this is um, raspberry jello, that's the color he wanted. So raspberry jello in Munich, when we did this, turned blue. <laughs> so it's like site specific jello. <laughs> and you have to be aware of it. And so um, his piece that dealt with the Earth Art exhibition and the, and the pressuring of media as a dominant aspect got um, faced off with um, Gary Shum's piece. And we put it on television rather than flat screen or projection just because it was a television program. Um, Keith Arnett is over there. Um, this is a Paracutan volcano project by Peter Hutchinson, and I threw it in here because this is another instance in which mainstream media became the commissioning sponsor for land art. This is a project in the um, sort of the tip of the volcano of Paracutan, and um, he was doing experiments with bread and mold and things like that. And Time Magazine sponsored the whole trip, you know, the travel there, everything that was needed for the um, execution of the work, for the right to publish the story on the work. Um, and so, in a way, land art was a totally photogenic and media-oriented practice. Um, media loved it in, um, in a mainstream way. Um, this also was made for the show Remade. It's, um, Helen and Newton Harrison's, the very first of their survival series, um, first done in Boston in the early 70s. And it was meant to have a hog, a pig, that will come and eat the grass, which was never realized in Boston because, you know, Boston said, you can't bring an animal in, into the museum. Um, but at the very end, I'll show you, we brought the pig in and the pig had a good time. Um, also, this work created huge headaches for the registrar and the conservator because live, I mean, it, it looks great, it felt great, you know, you, you come in from the heat of Los Angeles and this room was so cool and the air was so great, but it created so many bugs that, um, they, they, you know, that they had to control and the bugs started to move into other galleries. <laughs> um, so the registrar was freaked out and she said, you know, as soon as like this show comes down and we unscrew the frames, I know there's going to be bug shit all over and that it's going to be all your fault. <laughs> um, um, this, this room sort of toward the end became the room with a lot of the women artists from the early 70s. The front piece here is Alice Acock. Um, it's a work that she never could realize. She only did three panels when she first showed it, um, just because of space and such. So we got to realize it for her in, the, in this show. And clearly the idiom of minimalism, kind of, you know, uh, hybridizing with the material of the earth. Um, early Nancy Hole poetry that I think most people um, aren't aware of. And you could also see where Smithson gets some of his ideas. Um, the Boyle family, British um, group, family as a group, in which they, um, you know, throw darts drunkenly um, onto the map, go to that location, they do a kind of a sampling of the earth, kind of like the California Project by Baldessari, but, um, uh, but not exactly. Richard Long did a central piece. This is also a recreation. And with Richard, he wanted to be there. He has to do it himself. Um, no assistant can, you know, realize his work. Christo, I mean, it was a, it just went on and on. <laughs> um, we presented Spiral Jetty, the essay, um, with the thought that the work in the lake, the text, and the film are manifestations of Spiral Jetty. It's not the work out there is the primary, and then this is supplementary or documentary, but that, um, Oh, and we, we declare very boldly that there's no documentation in this exhibition. It's all artwork, except for maybe two pieces, the, the Japanese group. Um, and that became a point also of great um, discussion. But all the works that we showed, even, you know, we remade some, but they were shown as works in the time that they were made. So um, uh, we wanted to underscore this kind of hierarchy of what's first and what's second. Okay, let me just, 
This is the Israeli, the Eastern Europeans. You guys know these works, yeah? So um, this was actually one of my favorite rooms in the exhibition in which um, the kind of grandiosity of some of the American work was in here. Sense of humor was here, a kind of a quietness um, that I appreciated. Um, and a real shock to the Los Angeles audiences. Um, Iceland, I think. Um, so I, I'll just end with this, um, this video of um, bringing nature in. <laughs> so that's Newton Harrison on the far right. <laughs> And the pig didn't want to come out of its cage for a long time. Um, and Newton Harrison said it's because pigs don't know what they're normally supposed to do. They've been kind of contained and, you know, humanized too much. But after about 10, 15 minutes, it knew what to do, which was to just go crazy. <laughs> And they brought one in Munich too, but a much bigger, fatter, scarier one. <laughs> Yeah, that's Newton cutting it loose so he could just roam around. So we had um, the pig come and roam around for like five, six hours. Um, it went to sleep after a while. And then it um, was a hit with the kids, <laughs> little kids. And the Harrisons were, of course, happy because they never saw it ever with the pig as they had originally imagined it in 72. Anyway, I've kind of rambled. Um, I'm sorry, but that's kind of my headspace today. <laughs> anyway, thank you.